Assalamu alaikum, I'm Carl Arundel and you're watching In Focus. Now my guest today in this prestigious new London offices of Oasis, literally just behind the famous London store Harrods in Knightsbridge, is Adam Ismail Ibrahim. One would be forgiven for thinking that if you are talking about maintaining such high ethical standards um, and to comply with Islamic Sharia concepts and principles and protocols, that the risk, uh, the risk factors will be kept to a minimum and hence growth and returns are not going to be so great. Uh, how do the funds perform? I don't, uh, never believe that by following the path that was set up for us, we have to compromise on anything. So we don't have to compromise on service, we don't have to compromise on cost, we don't have to compromise on risk, and neither do we have to compromise on performance. And uh, in, alhamdulillah, 15 years of history shows that in South Africa, our first fund, the Oasis Crescent Fund, has outperformed its conventional competitors by 10% per annum over 50, 14 years. Now, and it is the lowest risk fund in the country. Now, that uh, you know, belies the issue that you have to compromise. And secondly, our global equity fund, which is now 12 years old, has outperformed its conventional peer group by about seven to eight percent per annum over that 10 to 12 years. We're not saying that's going to happen in the future, but I'm just looking at you know, the history. And there is no reason that if you implement the right strategy, um, not only OASIS, but anybody, if you implement the right strategy, complying with the rules and regulations that are set down for us as Muslims will never mean we have to compromise on anything. Most people will agree that three years ago the conventional Western financial system was on its knees. There was one eminent Islamic finance figure, Mohammed Saeed Rahman, he's the chairman of the US-based think tank, uh, the Institute for Halal Invest Investing. Uh, he said that the world's Islamic bankers were paralyzed and failed to take advantage of the opportunity. He said that the Islamic finance industry, and I quote, was not allowed exposure to CDOs, derivative products, and the kind of intra-financial counterparty risk that crippled conventional banks. He said it couldn't play the subprime mortgage game. It was backed by real money in the form of petro uh, re dollars and manufacturing export receipts. It was engaged, as he said, in simple, straightforward banking. So why? Why did it not react? Why did it not respond? Why was it paralyzed? I don't think it was paralyzed. And I actually think it's grown. It's shown its worth in this downturn. And I actually think it's prospered. So let's start off with Malaysia. Malaysia has actually positioned itself preeminently um, as a country in the leadership of Islamic finance. I recall that I was in, um, in Moscow talking at a conference um, last year. That was the week that Greece hit the wall. In that month and in th that period, no European government or company could raise money on the conventional bond markets. Malaysia raised a sukuk, um, it's an Islamic uh, 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 income instrument, and they raised that instrument right in the middle when the whole world had frozen up. And it was four to seven times oversubscribed and speaking to the people involved, it's made up of a combination not only of investors from the Muslim world and the Muslim market, but conventional investors because you have the security. So I think that great strides have been made. Places like Malaysia have done really, really well. There are, if we look at our own country, you know, at the end of this month, South Africa, if you look at South Africa, all the tax laws have changed, all the regulatory environment has changed, and South Africa at the end of this month, on the 29th of March, um, announces the winner um, of the financial service uh, uh, um, organization, or organizations that will take the first South African sukuk. Now it will be the first sovereign sukuk outside the Muslim world. Now, you know, that, does, that kind of argues that we've made tremendous progress. The member choice environment that you spoke about in the UK, in other environments, have, because those markets and there have been so many role players, they've worked fantastically. 
Um, two years ago, we didn't have an insurance solution, retirement solution. We have that. So we think on a two-year view, we think that the UK, or three-year view, inshallah, um, hopefully, with Oasis as, as being part of um, you know, the leadership position, we think uh, uh, the UK will develop with other organizations, other competitors. Um, the infrastructure is very strong, lots of talent available. So I think we'll have a fantastic solution. So Islamic finance is growing, Islamic finance is delivering, and yes, we don't invest in many of those things, those imaginary things, those things that are created, um, and they don't exist. And so surprise, surprise, if they don't, it don't exist in, in hard asset terms, don't be surprised when there's no value when you really place on it. So Islamic finance is based on very distinct principles of ethics, of ethical behavior, of uh, real assets, of um, behaving honorably and with dignity and respect. And I think if you operate with that principles, you have to be successful long term. Well, with those set of principles, uh, principles which people have been screaming about for the last three years, it would seem to me that your market, the market which at the moment seems to be, I don't know if I'm wrong about this, to focus on the Muslim community, or ought to be far bigger than that. I mean, I know you just rolled out to discuss, although you're very modest, what I see as some very grand plans for the next two to three years. But isn't there a scope for, for you to be creating products for the other 60 million people here in the UK? I think let's start off with uh, the core markets. Let's, be, let's not be too ambitious. Um, there are anything from 2.4 to 4 million Muslims in the UK. And if you assume that only one million is in, would be uh, um, able to buy the product, and you assume that maybe there's X number of um, household, uh, uh, people per household, so assume that's only 200,000 households. And if you then assume that there's 50,000 pounds available to invest, you're talking anything from 40, 50 to 100 billion pounds. Um, it's a big market. It's a big, big market. And what that does is it's um, not, a, it's a market that hasn't been managed. It's a market that is there, but it hasn't been harnessed. And inshallah, we will be part of the group of people and group of organizations that uh, set up the ta task and inshallah we're successful in harnessing that market, it will have a profound change on the employment in this country. If you have an industry with 100,000, 100 billion, uh, 200,000 uh, households with multiple accounts and multiple products, you're most probably talking about anything of, of an industry hiring between two and 10,000 people directly. And indirectly through the support, you're talking about creating an industry that hires between 10 and 25,000 people. And that is a massive contribution at a time when jobs are scarce globally, and a, a time when prudent principles are scarce globally. I think that 100 billion pounds plus between 10 and 25,000 jobs, that must be an exciting prospect for any individual, for any organization, for any mayor, for any government. And I believe that is our ambition, to well, provide a solution that delivers that. Well, on that remarkably uh, uplifting and um, positive uh, note, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, joining us on Islam Channel. Adam Ismail Ibrahim, uh, CEO of Oasis Group Holdings, thank you for joining us on Islam Channel. Carl, it's always a great pleasure, and you're looking dapper as always. Well